I learned to hate myself when I was only nine years old. And it was only a matter of time. I was an overweight, shy, awkward farm boy living in the country in Idaho. I was obsessed with video games and Lord of the Rings and Pokemon. I wore the same exact outfits every single day, and I refused to brush my teeth. And because of all of this and more, I was an easy target for this older kid on the school bus. No matter where I sat, he'd find me. He'd plop down in the seat right next to me, trapping me against the cold metal wall. He'd lower his voice just enough so that the driver couldn't hear. And that is where my education and self-hatred began. He gave me the nickname Chubbs. He taught me to hate how I looked with my fat cheeks, my long eyelashes, and secondhand clothes. He pointed out every stupid mistake I made every time I acted awkward or weird. He made sure I knew I was pathetic and worthless. I tried my best to escape my bully. At first, I played sick so that my parents, whom I never told what was going on, would let me stay home. But that only worked for a while before they caught on to my tricks and sent me to school anyway. So then, I tried prayer. When the bus rolled up to his house, I would whisper to myself, please God, please, send him to another school. Please, God, just, just have him stay home just today. I promise I'll be good. I promise I'll be good. As my prayers went unanswered, I realized I'd have to just be tough and try to ignore him. But that only made things worse. My backpack was ripped, my notebook stolen. I was slapped and shoved to the floor. And just when I thought I'd seen the worst my bully had to offer, he held me down against the seat and he hurt me until I wet myself. My prayers began to change. God, can you please just let me die? Do you have empathy for me in this moment? Can you sense your compassion for that young Kyler? Yeah, I can see that you care, even from here. But what I don't see is surprise, because my story isn't surprising. It's an everyday catastrophe. I don't need to show you the statistics on the prevalence rates of bullying, because those numbers just tell us what we already know. I don't need to share the research on how the wounds caused by bullying linger throughout our lives because so many of you still carry those wounds today. And I don't need to remind you that bullying is just one facet of a problem that affects us all, whether kids or adults. The problem is cruelty. If it happens at school, we call it bullying. If it happens at work, we call it harassment. Whatever label we put it on when someone deliberately and maliciously inflicts suffering on another, cruelty is the cause. And while we all recognize cruelty, we don't understand it. Why would anyone treat someone that way? How could anyone choose to be cruel? And at nine years old, these are the questions I was asking myself. I wondered why my bully was so mean to me. And I figured maybe he was just a bad person. And if I could just get away from him, I'd be okay. So I convinced my dad to start driving me to school. And for a while, I was free. But it didn't last. When I went from elementary to middle school, I traded one bully for many. Everywhere I went, I was still Chubbs, the awkward weirdo. Some of the popular girls would greet me by puffing out their cheeks so they looked like mine, and then laughing in my face. Even worse, my one true friend from elementary school decided that spending time with me was a liability. I was alone. I realized that my earlier theory was wrong. The bully on the bus couldn't be the messed up one because everybody at school is just like him. The problem must be me. If young Kyler had asked you why his classmates were so cruel, what would you have said? It's a hard question. Maybe you would have told me it was because of their parents that bullies are just raised wrong. 
Maybe you would have said it was impossible for me to know. I was just a kid. I should probably just focus on something else. Or maybe you would have blamed violent video games. Who knows? Well, I knew. After years of being tormented by bullies, I figured it out. I discovered why people choose cruelty. It started with my sister. She made things easy for me because she was just like me. Overweight, shy, awkward, friendless. And just like my bullies did to me, I made sure she knew it. I made fun of her weight and I teased her till she cried. I even called her chubs. I taught her to hate herself and it made me feel so much better. Cruelty offered me a way out of my suffering. I felt better when I made others miserable, which is why it didn't stop with my sister. I felt strong when I made fun of the gay kid for being gay. I felt included when I would mock the exchange student and my classmates laughed. And when one time during football practice, I hit one of my teammates so hard that I busted his collarbone as he lay there on the field, broken and sobbing. I felt alive. For the first time in my life, I had power. I was someone, and I was never going back, no matter what it cost the people around me. Do you have empathy for Kyler the bully? Are you feeling compassionate right now? Probably not. Cruelty evokes powerful emotions, rage, disgust, terror. <laughs> These emotions keep us safe. They prepare us to defend ourselves against cruelty. They prepare us for war. And in war, there is no room for empathy. We can't afford to feel the pain that we'll inflict on our enemies if we want to survive. An ancient Cherokee legend tells the tale of a boy who discovers a rattlesnake cold and dying on a mountaintop. The snake begs the boy to take him down where it's warm, to which the boy says, no, you're a snake, you'll bite me. Well, the snake promises not to do so, so the boy carries him down. And as they reach the bottom, the snake strikes. As the boy lays there dying, the snake tells him, you knew what I was when you picked me up. This is how we see the world. We tell ourselves that some people are good and kind, while others are snakes, and it's in their nature to harm. And yet, we all share the same nature, human nature. It is because they are human that desperate people choose cruelty. I was drowning in suffering and I made others suffer because of it. That was awful. And it was the only way I knew to survive. When our deep human needs go unmet, cruelty can feel like our only choice. And that is why our normal strategies for dealing with cruelty fail. We try our best to protect others from the suffering caused by bullying but we rarely address the suffering that causes bullying. In fact, we often cause our bullies to suffer more. Zero tolerance for bullying in schools, for example. If you bully, you're a threat, and we want you out. Other kids bullied you first. Your grandma just died. You don't have enough money for food. We don't care. Get out. Why are we so cruel to our bullies? It's because we don't care about them. We see it as us and them, humans and snakes, and they're not human anymore. So instead of ending cruelty, we give it more suffering to feed on. It doesn't have to be that way. The insecurities caused by my bullying began to eat my sister alive and she stopped eating. She went from overweight to thin, 
from thin to emaciated, and from emaciated to almost dead because of a horrific eating disorder. I will never forget the sight of her, collapsed from exhaustion on the stairs in our family home, a skeleton in place of my baby sister. She went to inpatient treatment for a year, and in that time, I learned to hate myself even more. How could I have done this? Why am I so broken, so bad? When her treatment finished, and it was time for her to finally come home, I waited for her to be angry at me. I wanted her to yell and scream and blame. I deserved it. I was the monster who did this to her. But that didn't happen. Instead, she came running up to me. She threw her arms around me, and with tears in her eyes, she said, Kyler, it's okay. I still love you. In an instant, my world turned upside down. How could anyone accept me after all I'd done? But if my sister could accept me, if she could love me, then maybe I could learn to love too. My sister had every right to see me as a snake, as a monster. But instead, she saw me as a human being, as her brother. And then she chose to act, not with rejection, but with radical compassion. Radical compassion is a choice. It is the choice to be loving, even when that love is not earned. It is the choice to see someone as a brother, not a snake. It is the choice to give someone what they need, not what they deserve. My sister made that choice. And she's not alone. Aubrey Fontenot found out that his son was being bullied. After confronting the bully, he discovered that the bully and his mother had lost their home and were living in the streets. Aubrey then made the choice to buy his son's bully new clothing, to offer friendship and care, and even raised thousands of dollars to help the family. Instead of seeing an enemy, he saw a person in need. Rose Espinoza was worried about her family's safety because the neighborhood was frequented by gang violence. Instead of barricading her home or just moving away, Rose made a different choice. She transformed her garage into a K-12 tutoring program, offering free food and education to youth in the area. And within two years, crime rates in the neighborhood plummeted and academic performance improved. Instead of building a wall, she opened a door. Charletta Evans's three-year-old son was shot to death by a teenager in a drive-by shooting. After the trial, Charletta made the choice to meet with the teen that killed her baby. She then made the choice to forgive him, even love him, even consider him family. Years later, he still calls her mother, and she calls him son. These stories are uncomfortable, and that's the point. Radical compassion is radical. To choose love in the face of hurt and fear, it seems unthinkable. And yet, it works. A recent study examined different practices for addressing bullying in a sample of 745 schools in California. The odds of bullying in schools that used compassionate, supportive practices was found to be 90% less than schools that used more punitive and exclusionary measures. 90%. That is the power of choosing compassion. 
If cruelty is our venom, compassion is our cure. And each of you has the power to offer that cure. It doesn't matter if you're not a touchy-feely type. It doesn't matter if you feel angry towards those who are cruel. What matters is your choice because you don't have to feel loving to choose love. Here's my challenge. The next time someone hurts you, you will have a choice. You can choose to treat them like a snake or like a human being. And the way you treat them will affect how they treat themselves. Because some of the people who hurt you will believe deep down that they are bad people, that they are snakes. They might believe that cruelty is the only way they can get what they need in this world. But we know that they're not snakes. They're people just like us. And we can help them see that too. In that moment, when you feel hurt, when the natural response would be to treat that person like an enemy, I want you to do something unnatural. I want you to look past the serpent. See the person who is struggling. Imagine the wounds that cause them to lash out with cruelty. And then, respond with love. Maybe that means just walking away and not striking back. Maybe it means doing the hard work of forgiveness and letting go of any bitterness you may have toward them. Maybe it means giving them the chance to experience some kindness, whether through a gentle response or an offer to help. Whatever love looks like in that moment, choose it. Most of the time, when you do this, you won't notice any difference, and that's okay. You don't have to wait around for kindness to change them, especially if you're being abused or the cruelty continues. Just know that you've planted a seed of kindness in the other person, or at least stopped a seed of cruelty from growing in yourself. But sometimes, rarely, you will see the power of compassion in all of its glory. Sometimes you'll see a murderer realize he can still be forgiven. Sometimes you'll see a brother feel worthy of his sister's love. And sometimes you'll see a bully learn what it takes to love himself.